Hello, and welcome to Finextra's In Conversation With. Today, we're speaking with Hugh Stewart, who's Sales Director of Declear Services, which is part of SmartStream. And we're also speaking with Jonathan Clark, who's Group CEO of CitySoft. Now, the conversation we're going to be talking about today is reference data. Now, the last bit of research that I've read blames almost 60% of all failed trades on reference data. And you know, in, in a perfect world, every bank will have access to manageable, actionable reference data at low cost. And we all know the reality is much less rosy. So I think the conversation we're going to be talking about today is the road to reference data nirvana with all the potholes and all the speed bumps. So I'm going to start off my questions with you, Jonathan. I mean, reference data is supposedly static. But we all know it's fed from uh, you know, a range of internal and external prov uh, providers. It's fed into disparate data, s data silos. And reference data, sort of the, the holy grail, is to have this enterprise golden copy, this mythical golden copy. However, it, is that even practical? I mean, it, does the industry need a golden copy? And is there a more practical solution? Mm, it's a <laughs> challenging question to start with. Um, yeah, in, in my view, I think that um, the golden copy probably is achievable in certain organisations, um, whereas in others where they're um, perhaps tier one organisations and global banks with multi-regional um, consumers of the data and many different departments, they've got different needs and different understandings of what that data is. And the celebrated example is always to talk about the, the customer or the, the client data. So even arriving at a definition of what that, what the customer is, 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 is can be quite um, challenging when you look at the different parts of an organisation. Um, so um, for, for some people, it's it's the someone that pays you money currently, someone but that buys your products or or services currently. For others, it might be those that bought those products or services within the last twelve months, or maybe it should be the twenty-four months before or, or whatever. Um, for other departments, it might be the future um, customer those that you haven't yet got. And then should it be the IFA or should it be the beneficial customer at the end of it? So it's always it's, it's, it, within uh, organisations with multiple disparate uses of data, um, I think that it, it can be quite challenging to define what that actual um, um, item of data is. So, but if you go down into the, perhaps the tier two or smaller organisations, they're perhaps less um, challenged by those uh, question. So perhaps the, the golden copy, the, the, the single version of um, the data is more achievable in that sort of uh, so organisation. Small community banks can have this sort of the, that core idea of the golden copy while huge big banks like Citi, they're going to have maybe different groups. That but are e even the big banks like Citi, they still mm -hmm. need it. There are many drivers of why they want to, should uh, consolidate and cons concentrate that that data. So even where there are multiple consumers, um, um, it, it, it's a challenge, so it becomes a question. It's a very long journey to, to, to go on, uh, but that shouldn't preclude them from, from embarking on that journey at the outset, I think. So there might be, might be multiple versions of that um, uh, item of data, multiple versions of <laughs> truth coming in, but you really want a single one coming out of the, at the other end to then yeah. distribute around the organisation. Or one can think of it as a cascade that where there can be commonality, one can have a, a super gold copy, but when one starts looking at other downstream systems, other departments, suddenly timeliness, accuracy, you know, are becoming, you know, become different issues. So in a way, it'd be great if one could sort of do a big clean and scrub up and, and assemble a, a sort of a, a generic gold copy and then start sort of adding, either adding, aggregating, cleaning in different ways, identifying, you know, sort of running particular rules depending on the on the downstream system. But so it's a, but it is. You know, there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to achieve this sort of clean, scrubbed enterprise data that that brings us into the the topic of of, of cost cutting, mm. which is always popular mm. with banks when it comes to data management. What are some of the trends we're seeing with cost cutting? Well, cost is an interesting um, question because and it, from our perspective, and we typically focus more on perhaps on buy side firms. But we find that, th that there are two associated costs with data management. There's the, the cost of acquiring the data, the direct costs that go out to the um, source provider of that data. Um, and that can be quite disparate. If, if the consumers are siloed and the, the each 
um, department has its own uh, relationship with a data vendor, uh, you might find that um, across the organisation that multiple people are buying the same data. There's a lot of duplication. You might also find that they bought data, data for a particular reason. Perhaps a new fund manager came on board with a, a particular preference. Uh, but you might have since left and you, you, you'll find that they're still buying redundant data. So there's a lot of cost leakage within the um, data sources themselves, which can be rationalised and um, one can audit it and improve it, but unless one puts a layer of governance and control on it, it then migrates away from that uh, rationalised position. But in addition to that, in addition to the direct cost that goes out to the, to the vendor, um, there's an enormous co you know, cost, x, x times cost of uh, um, validating it and cleansing it and distributing it. And I think um, a lot of organisations don't really have a handle on that total cost of ownership of, mm -hmm. of data. I mean, so, so uh, it, is this moving into a conversation of, of outsourcing that data management or going into software as a service or should I dare say cloud yeah. computing? I mean, have you been seeing that trend Absolutely. happening that they're moving yeah. into that area? I, I, I think that total cost of ownership is a, is a real driver. And I think once, if organisations do get their um, um, handle on the, uh, are able to uh, accurately um, quantify the costs associated with, with getting the data right, then they compare it to the cost of paying someone that's specialist in that area and um, to, to do that outside their foot firm and just to have one pipe of clean, correct, accurate and timely data coming in, then I think there's a, a very good cost justification for it. So, I mean, there's, I mean, the cost justification for outsourcing and cloud computing is, is obvious, but what are the sort of data governance ramifications of that in terms of regulation and dealing with the data if, if a firm is going to go down that route? Yeah, clear, clearly there has to be very rigid and, well not, not clearly, but, but one does have to put in place very rigid um, governance and, and clear rules that are communicated and disseminated throughout the organisation. Um, and there needs to be a, um, a monitoring of adherence to those rules because if, it, if, if they're not then um, the, the having spent a lot of time and effort and considerable amounts of money in getting to a, a good point, you can very quickly diverge from it again. Yeah. I mean, some of the, the facts that sort of we've sort of come across is that uh, one bank was spending a dollar for data and then $19 mm -hmm. in is were value adds, cleaning, scrubbing, maintaining, aggregating, before that data got to a downstream application. And I think that, and, and maybe that's not the worst case, it probably is not the best case either. So that there's just got to be a cleverer way of, 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 of handling data where both from a governance point of view, both internal governance and the regulator, these are, there's going to be a, a big spend you know, that the regulator is going to demand, a huge spend, an additional spend. Already margins are being you know, sort of uh, you know, attacked. So that this is a horrible situation for financial institutions. They've got to pay a lot more for regulation. At the same time, they're, they're, and they've got to raise their game, otherwise they lose a license to operate. At the same time, they don't have as much money to, to fritter away. And I think that they've been living in a, mm. a sort of a rather privileged world compared to the pharmaceutical industry or um, you know, manufacturing industry. You know, banking financial institutions have just enjoyed large margins. And so now they've got to get, you know, do some sort of what is, to some people, Turkey's voting for Christmas or unpalatable things. Um, and and uh, one of those is, is perhaps the focus on, on internal regulation, internal governance and profitability and leave some of the, the work that hitherto they've done before, like being a software house or rep repetitively bank after bank doing the same data scrubbing, they've got to perhaps move that outside uh, you know, and stop being software houses mm. and stop being data geeks where, where they can actually subcontract that, that, that type of work to someone else, like d -Clear. <laughs> Well done, get the plug. Yeah, yeah, well, that's just what I'm paid to do. <laughs> it's probably true to say it's uh, an evolving model mm. at this stage. It's probably not fully mature yet, and there are, there are probably those pioneers that need to take um, that jump. I think there are a lot of firms that are unsure of what, what, how the regulations are going to affect where, you know, who owns mm. the data, who's in control of the mm. data, um, can, we, can we get at it, what happens if our supplier mm goes bust, yep. you know, those are, those are issues I think a lot of firms are dealing with right mm. now. So mm. Maybe one should have a mix, I mean, I, I, mm. nothing you know, should ever be like pure, you know, there's no sort of single model, one model fits all, and, and, even, and with a, a simple or a, a complex financial organisation, there is fiduciary responsibilities, which means that they have to take responsibility for developing software 
um, and, and, and managing data, but, but perhaps with a lighter footprint than, than is, is, is traditionally available. So that in a way that one has a mixed model of perhaps using you know, the, you know, the cloud or managed data services, external suppliers, while at the same time protecting oneself by responsible for data quality, responsible for data governance, and, and, and perhaps being able to, uh, for example, using the software approach, you know, having internal skills or a, a, a dual vendor approach. So there's this sense of you know, the cloud as well as internal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Salesforce.com I mean, yeah. being the example. I think, I think this sort of uh, brings us into a talk about regulations. I mean, we all know what Basel II and MIFID has done mm -hmm. to data management. What, what are some of the regulatory drivers affecting data management now? Well, virtually all regulatory changes are driving um, um, management of data, I think. You know, whether it's on the um, client side, know your client, and um, treating customer fairly, best execution, all of that means you need to aggregate that information. You, we talked earlier about different views on the client and different um, parts of the organisation, but really it does need to be drawn into a, um, a, a centralised environment for regulatory purposes at, at some point. Similarly with counterparties, we're looking at, at credit risk and um, risk of um, systemic risk from um, uh, organis organisations failing, as we've uh, seen recently. Similarly with um, um, security and market reference data, um, you, you need to be able to see your, your um, total uh, risk position um, the potential liabilities that you have um, versus the, the assets to look at your overall capital adequacy. So all of the regulations, I think, are driving this or pointing towards a much more um, a rigorous data management regime within organisations. I mean, all the talk right now is on MIFID two and the MIFID review, but I wanted to go back and, and find out uh, specifically about uh, uses for, and I mean, how, how is that affecting the industry? It, it's providing a lot more flexibility, and I think it's a, it's helping um, asset managers become more profitable, etc., and so that they can have single bases. But there is a lot more responsibility in terms of what, you know, what, 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 uh, how, how, how behaviour is, how their behaviour is. For example, you know, there's eligibility um, uh, criteria, and therefore it's classic data management where you have to, you know, whiz a portfolio through a, a sort of a filter to make sure that the content of the portfolio. It, it conforms, and so, and again, that's a, a classic thing which can be, you know, why is everyone sort of running their own eligibility rules? Maybe it wouldn't be great if you could just put it through, sort of, you know, a, you know, a single utility that sort of checks, you know, on a daily basis or a periodic basis of, of elig eligibility. So, um, you know, data management is all part of the warp and weft of 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 of, um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of regulation. It's it's fundamental. It's suddenly lifted up you know, a poor relation in, 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 into being you know, a, a very significant family member in, in terms of a discipline. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about counterparty risk and systemic risk, and, and you know, the reference data world is, always talks about these universal identifiers for yes. legal entities, you know, and Myth of Review is talking about you know, mapping trades back to the legal entity. Well, you know, is that, is that legal entity going to become like that mythical golden copy? Is it going to be this unattainable goal? Or, or where, where are we on that road to universal identifiers? Well, I guess my view is it, it would be nice and um, would be wonderful for... Um, you can see a, a, a tremendous amount of benefit to um, the, uh, the industry as a whole um, if we move to, uh, towards universal identifiers. But on the other hand, it, it's one of these... Um, another standard that people try to impose and not, there's not a, a lot of um, impetus or investment from the organisations themselves to move towards that, um, to that goal. They'd rather spend their money on um, things that really add value to their business within the, their four walls. So they're, they're wanting um, um, faster access to the data, you know, nearer real time and spending more money on those algorithmic trading platforms that come off that perhaps. Um, so whether or not um, a legislated um, um, identifier would, would, would work, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that's probably a, a, a very long time, at, time out. But on the other hand, you've got market practice that in the past that's always sort of driven um, um, uh, this, this sort of situation. And we've got at the moment, I think, Bloomberg making their global identifiers open and 
perhaps Chris, universal. With, with, with the method review about using CEDAL, you know, the, as, the, as an identifier, and but I think they've all had their weaknesses: CEDAL and ISIN and and uh, RICS and such like. So there are many to choose from. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah. It's a great thing about standards, but, you know, yeah, there's so many of them. I did sort of disagree a bit with Jonathan. I think it's going to happen. You know, it's, it's going to happen, and I think that, that um, I think July this year, there's a, you know, there'll be a significant decision point. Or a, and it's great for data management. It's going to increase the uh, number of uh, you know, reference, symbology cross-referencing. So it's just another, it will occur because you need it for system, to measure systemic risk. It's, it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, it's a great show to watch to see how the, you know, the large organisations, the uh, for-profit, semi-for-profit are, um, are, are nudging and elbowing each other to see, you know, the, can theirs be used? Is theirs fully open? Is every data item associated with a, a, you know, an open standard or an open identification is it you know, is it, you know there, there is a lot of it's a good comment it's, it's great it's like a watching a film who's going to win who, you know mm. what's going to happen and, and but it's going to happen it's going to increase the responsibility of data management i think it'll move then towards standardization if not of instruments of how you look at positions and exposures and it will start meaning that there's a maybe more common and transparent ways of pricing and 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 uh, calibrating and, and, and measuring risk. So I think this is the, uh, you know, the, the, the break in the dike, as it were, where suddenly, and unfortunately, financial institutions are going to have to pay for it because no one else is going to. No, you know, governments haven't got enough money. So you know, banks, asset managers, hedge funds, etc., all of which are being drawn in bit by bit you know, by, by the various regulations that are different in different parts of the world. Therefore, they're going to ha their profitability is going to be attacked. Therefore, they've got to change their operating model and particularly with how they handle data. I mean, isn't I mean, you know, sorry, I mean, I think an industry-led solution tends to work better, but it takes so long mm. to get a consensus. Mm. So, I mean, there's sort of a you know a, a give and take about where do you have a mandate? Do you have an industry-led solution, and what are the pros and cons of both? And I think it's going to be mandated. I, I think that you can't, you can't bring all the exposures together around the world in order to measure systemic risk without having a sort of a common indexing point. You, mm -hmm. you need one identifier. And it just adds to all the others. So that means you're, you know, you're the, you know, it, it's something more to be mapped. Uh, because some 20, 30-year-old um, banking application isn't magically going to be able to take the structure of a, a new legal identifier. It'll want the old identifier it's got. So, you'd, so it's, 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 it's great for the data management industry, but it's essential for the global financial uh, industry. And I, I, you know, no, I do agree. It's, I mean, it's good for the industry as a whole, but I just don't see the investment institutions themselves yeah. um, investing the sort of sums of money that would require them to, to change. Mm -hmm. So I, I think um, unless they are forced into it yes. and, and mandated to, and I, I, I think that's a, a long way off, there'll be lobby groups and all mm -hmm. sorts before it <laughs> okay. becomes reality. Um, so I think in, in, in the meantime, they will adopt um, market practice, and, and it, it'll be another GSTPA or something like that, <laughs> and another T oh, plus no. one. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we are seeing sort of you know central clearing of counterparties for OTC derivatives, and isn't that having a stabilizing effect on the industry? Or well, the, the jury is out. Is it mm -hmm. is it just another concentration of risk um, that that that, 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 it, that creates a, a clearing? sort of venue that is too big to fail but all I know is that the more 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 venues there are the more trading venues there are the more clearing venues there are that that that, that adds to complexity there's a difference in lot sizes tick sizes in terms of business rules associated already with exchanges there's a you know the whole thing about closing prices not everyone's closing price is the same mm -hmm. so this this is going to spread more so there's going to be greater complexity and you've got to have better data management you've got to have more business rules sort of applied to data because you're dealing with multiple clearing you know, multiple execute swap swap execution facilities etc it's 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 it, it in a way, there's it, some sort of uh, paradox where in order to get uh, sort of greater security, it, you need greater complexity, even though complexity itself is a danger and a threat to security. You know, sometimes when I, I make the mistake when I think of reference data, I think of the huge back offices and sell-side banks, but how are the, you know, the buy-side clients, how are, they, how are they driving these changes in data management? What do they want? What are they demanding from the banks? Yeah, I, I think there, there are two ways of answering that really. There's the way that they, the actual data that they need and that they um, consume and there is, uh, that, that is just um, growing at an exponential rate I think and, and I, th I think um, 
a lot of the buy side firms are moving towards nearer real time data. You used to have sort of um, market data, which, if you like, was the tick by tick mm. prices they had on the screens on their on their desks, and then the um, the reference data, which drove the back office mm. and the the um, post trade execution transaction processing and such like. And nowadays, those two are are really merged, and the the um, I'm not saying that you need necessarily real time data in the back office. But the way of managing that data has merged, and, and some organisations have put in place these platforms, and that's the other way of looking at it, is the so not the data usage, but the, the way in which you manage it. Um, and a lot of organisations have put in place these, um, I suppose you call EDMs, enterprise um, by data management uh, in, environments. But those are big and expensive and clunky to change and quite inflexible. So the the newer model is to perhaps wrap around a um, an operational data store mm -hmm. layer around it which is much more nimble and flexible and, and allows um, one to bring in a new data source and uh, validate it and cleanse mm -hmm. it and pass it on uh, more quickly and um, less expensively. So I think the environment on the buy side is, is, is changing quite a lot and a lot of people question whether you should have that, why doesn't the EDM do it? So. Um, again, I think these these area um, these models are evolving um, at the moment, and, and there there isn't a um, a panacea. There isn't a universal model that all organisations buy into. Excellent. Well, I think that's all we have time for right now. Thank you very much for talking about the the complex world of, of reference data. So, and I want to thank you for watching Finextra in conversation with.